Here's your spoiler warning for the Snowpiercer movie and the first five episodes of the TV show. I'll also apologise in advance for the poor quality of some of these images. Now I, like a lot of people, really enjoyed the Snowpiercer movie, and so I got really excited when I realised there was going to be a show. But after watching the first episode, I was really disappointed. It was like they weren't even making an attempt at keeping continuity with the movie. None of the characters from the movie are present in the show, despite being set only 10 years before. The architecture of the train seems to be completely different, and uh, so does Mr. Wilford. So are these massive discrepancies between the movie and the show due to low budget and lazy writing? Or is it because they're on two separate trains? So I'll spend the first part of this video just explaining the theory and then go over the evidence in detail. So if you only want to stay for the explanation, you have that option. I'm not the only one who's come up with this theory, but I did arrive at it independently, which is why I won't cite any other sources. In short, my theory is that the show and the movie are set on two different trains. The show train is an early prototype, and while it's extremely long-lasting, it is not truly eternal like the movie train is. Melanie was one of the engineers that helped Wilford design the train, and so when the freeze was approaching, Wilford put her in charge of the show train, while he himself boarded the movie train. I believe that these two trains used to be in contact with one another, but communication has since been lost. In episode 5, Melanie mentions experiments involving the drawers. This could be anything, but one possibility is that Melanie, and 399 others, plan to hibernate in the drawers once the show train finally dies, to wait out the cold until the Earth thaws and Mr. Wilford, on the movie train, can come and rescue them. Now there are a lot of differences between the movie and the show in the first episode, including complete lack of movie characters in the show. But this all comes to a head when Melanie arrives at the front of the train, where the engine is in the movie, and we see a control room, and Bennett calls her Mr. Wilford. This has led to multiple theories. Perhaps Wilford is dead, perhaps Melanie killed or imprisoned him and took over. What is clear is that Melanie is running the train. As a side note, I've heard some people theorising that Mr. Wilford doesn't and never did exist, but I don't buy into that at all. Roche said that he shook Mr. Wilford's hand sometime before he boarded, and Melanie takes sound bites from a previous speech of his to make a short announcement. I'd even go so far as to say that most of the first class passengers have met him at one point or another. They've all invested a lot of money into Snowpiercer, and I'm pretty sure you'd want to meet a guy, or at least see them, before giving him a small fortune. Now let's talk about the various pieces of evidence throughout the movie and show, both for and against there being two trains. The first, and potentially most obvious piece of evidence, is Gilliam. At the start of the movie, Gilliam is the leader of the tail sections, or tailies as they're known in the show. Now in all fairness, we don't know how long he's been their leader, but I'd say it's pretty safe to assume that he slipped into the role after he cut off his arms for cannibals to eat, in order to save baby Edgar's life. Gilliam is not just their leader, he is also a figure of respect, and he definitely should have at least appeared at some point in the show so far. Curtis and Edgar not appearing is excusable, as both of them would have been quite a bit younger in the show, but if Gilliam is on that train, he should have appeared. While we're on the topic of cannibalism, Curtis said that after Gilliam sacrificed his arm, Others did the same, and it seems to have been the end of violent cannibalism in the tale. However, in the show, it seems that the cannibalism was ended after Leighton killed their leader and ate his heart. This isn't concrete, but it does seem to show these two trains finding the same problem and coming up with different solutions. Another character we definitely should have seen is Minister Mason. She's Mr. Wolford's representative in the tale, and even if she doesn't step into that role until after the events of the show, we should still expect her to be a prominent or well-known figure in the front. As a side note, at the start of the show, I thought maybe Ruth was Minister Mason, as she has the same accent, the same love of fur coats, and fulfills the same role. But Ruth's last name is listed as Wardell, so there goes that theory. Unless Wardell is her maiden name and she gets married. Is that a wedding ring? No. We've got to stay on topic. But if I'm wrong about the two trains thing, I want to be right about that as a consolation prize. Now let's talk about the front carriage. My first thought when I saw this was, that's not the sacred engine. Now most of you are probably thinking the engine is under the control room, and you may be right. It's possible that Bennett and Javier each have their sleeping quarters directly under the control room, but even then there's plenty of room for the sacred engine. The reason I don't think the control room is above the sacred engine is because of the carriages leading up to the engine. There are no ladders or stairways or anything to suggest there are multiple levels. It's difficult to show in still images, but if you go back and watch the second act of the movie, you'll see that there's nothing to suggest that the movie train has multiple levels. The ceiling of the engine room is also curved, implying that there's nothing above it. In fact, most carriages in the movie train are like this, whereas the show train is implied to be multi-layered. 
while we're on train architecture, remember in episode one when they're taking Leighton up train for the first time and there's a sort of train within a train running through a small tunnel? Uh, Leighton knows about that now and he would have had a chance to send that info to the tail. Now, if they're on the same train, then that tunnel should have still been there during the movie and the tail sectioners would have known about it. So why didn't they use it? Now onto guns. On the movie train, all of the guards in the tail have assault rifles and we know that they used them to put down the last rebellion. But on the show train, guns are extremely rare and all but banned. At the end of episode 1, the reinforcements sent to put down the revolt don't have guns. Not even Commander Grey. They have things strapped to their back that look like rifles, but they're actually machetes. In episode 4, it's revealed that the only guns on Snowpiercer are the ones carried by first class security, and even then, it's only their sidearms. Wilford security knows that Eric has a gun, but they don't send gunmen after him, they just send a lot of guys with tomahawks. There's also the drawers. They're located in different positions on each train. On the movie train, there are exactly four carriages in front of the tail section, that's a key part of the first act. But in the show train, they're in the third section, and there are clearly way more than four carriages between them and the tail section. Not to mention the drawers look entirely different. They also work differently, but that's not much of a surprise given the events of the show. Speaking of third section, by the way, as far as we can tell on the movie train, they just don't exist. On the show train, there's first, second, and third class, and then the tailies. But in Minister Mason's speech, she mentions first class, economy, and freeloaders like you, referring to the tail. Now, it is a bit of a coincidence that both the train and the movie got boarded, but honestly, I don't find it that surprising. People want to live. Now, you could argue that if they are the same train, then maybe third class gets eradicated between the show and the movie. But the language Mason uses strongly suggests that that is not the case. In the beginning, order was prescribed by your ticket. And she's trying to make a point about the class system never changing. Now, this is probably the most compelling piece of evidence for there being two separate trains. The cows. In episode 2, a bunch of cows die, and Melanie says it's an extinction event. In the next episode, Melanie and Bennett talk about it, and it's confirmed that they were in fact talking about the cows. Now this was what finally caused me to go back and watch the movie, and sure enough, they talk about steak on multiple occasions. In fact, Edgar mentions it in the first full conversation of the movie. And when we get to the end, Wilford is eating steak. And don't try and tell me that's lamb or pork or something, Curtis specifically says it's steak. Now you could argue that maybe, when the cows all died, they cut them up and preserved the steak, and now only Mr. Wilford is allowed to eat it. But that doesn't explain this. Now, I'm not an expert butcher, but I'm pretty sure that's a cow. So those are my main pieces of evidence for there being two trains. Now I'll address some of the evidence that could potentially disprove or complicate my theory. First up is Cronol. At face value, the existence of Cronol in both the show and the movie seems to disprove the theory that they're on two trains. Cronol seems to be a drug that was invented and named after the freeze, and so the odds of both trains having the same drug and having the same name are astronomical. Except when you look a little deeper, there's so much more to it than that. On the movie train, Cronol is a solid that you sniff. Tanya says it's big in the front section, and Gilliam says that it's made from industrial waste. Now, on the show train, Cronol is distilled from the chemical used on the sleepers in the drawers, and it's possibly in liquid form. Not to mention, in the movie, Nam Goon is woken by the smell of movie Cronol, which very much suggests it's not the same as show Cronol. So it seems the only similarity between show Cronol and movie Cronol are that they're both hallucinogens and the name Cronol. But even them sharing a made up name seems to be a pretty big coincidence. This is where things get confusing. When Curtis gets Cronol from the creepy drug guy in the beginning, it is in a tin actually labelled Cronol. Look at that tin. That wasn't made on the train, it was made sometime before the freeze. It even has a tiny flammable symbol on it, see? I honestly don't know how to explain this, but if I had to guess, I'd say that maybe Cronol was used for something else in this universe, and prior to the freeze, people were starting to discover that it was a hallucinogen, and so the people on the train named their hallucinogen after it. I know it's a stretch, but honestly I have no idea what to make of this tin, whether there's one train or two. Next is the protein blocks. On the show train and the movie train, the protein blocks look very similar, which suggests they're made out of the same thing. Bugs. The tailings were never meant to be on the train, and so the protein bars were an improvised solution. So Melly and Wilford both came up with the same solution. Is that too much of a coincidence? Well, I don't think so. As I said earlier on, I believe that the two trains were once in contact with one another, but have since lost contact. You can just imagine the phone call between Melanie and Wilford discussing their mutual border problem. During Curtis's confession, he says that they resorted to cannibalism a month after boarding, 
and they got their protein blocks a month after Gilliam cut his arm off. We don't know how much time passed between the start of the cannibalism and Gilliam cutting off his arm, but I'm guessing it wasn't that long. We do know, however, there was enough time for Curtis to eat at least two people, hence the babies taste best line. So let's say a month. That means that it took the people running the movie train three months to build the machine that makes the protein blocks from scratch, which is pretty impressive if you ask me. It likely took a lot longer on the show train, as we can see that Leighton had short hair when he boarded, but dreadlocks when he ate the heart. That hair would have taken ages to grow. Zara also isn't present in the flashback, which suggests that the cannibalism was ended on the show train after she was transferred. In episode 1, Leighton says he hasn't seen Zara in 5 years, so that means that on the show train, cannibalism went on for at least 2 years, which is almost certainly longer than it went on in the movie train, because Edgar was still a baby when it ended, and he was almost certainly born, or at least conceived, before the freeze. Now onto the number of revolutions. It's stated outright in the opening credits that they make 2.7 revolutions a year. That's in blatant opposition with the movie train, which makes one revolution per year, with the new year being marked by the crossing of Yekaterina Bridge. In Miss Audrey's testimony, she says that they've been on the train for seven years and have done 19 revolutions in that time. Now, before this realisation, I had assumed that the show train and the movie train were on the same track, which would explain why Melanie was afraid to slow down too much in episode 2 but the fact that the show train is doing laps of the earth much faster than the movie train suggests that they are on different tracks. Another clue Miss Audrey's testimony gives us is that the passengers boarded the train from Chicago. Now this got me really excited. Look at this map from the movie. Now I'm not an American, so I had to look this up to be sure, but get this, Chicago is around here. It's hard to tell exactly because the Great Lakes are all frozen over on this map, but one thing's for sure, this track doesn't run through Chicago. They are two separate trains on two separate tracks. We don't really know where the movie train boarded, but we can guess it was somewhere in America because of the various American holidays on the map. Having said that, this might just be because Wilford is American. It's heavily implied by the news reports at the start of the movie that CW7 was dispersed on the 1st of July 2014, which basically eliminates anywhere between Ekaterina and North Carolina as being boarding points. In all likelihood, the movie train boarded somewhere on the east coast of America, around 2,000 kilometers away from Chicago. I'd say the case is pretty much close at this point, but let's take a look at the route of the show train. Now, the line isn't complete, but we can play connect the dots. Unlike the movie train, the show train goes through Australia and Chicago. While we're on the topic of geography, may I add that the population of the show train seems a lot less culturally diverse than the population of the movie train. On the show train, we've heard people speaking Spanish, and we hear Lila Folger complaining about the Europeans in the sauna in episode 1, and that's about it. The rest is just American. However, on the show train, they have those translator devices, and as a bit of fun trivia for you, a little over 15% of the dialogue is in a language other than English. Nam Goon obviously speaks Korean, and when Minister Mason is giving her speech, the translators speak three languages, and may have spoken more if they weren't cut off. The Netflix subtitles don't tell you what those languages are, but at an uneducated guess, I'd say French, Spanish, and Chinese, or maybe it's Korean. It's difficult for me to tell, but maybe someone who knows can tell me in the comments. Edgar also speaks Japanese to a man when he takes his barrel off him. Okay, now I think I've got the two trains thing down, let's talk about the drawers. Episode 5 gives us some big clues on this one. Around 12 minutes into the episode, when Melanie is getting a report from Henry, she says, We have 400 drawers. Someday we may have 400 sleepers. They can't re-emerge traumatised. Interesting that Melanie knew exactly how many drawers they have off the top of her head. And no, she didn't read it from the clipboard. That's a coroner's report. Not only that, she seems awfully concerned with the well-being of the people in the drawers, considering they're meant to be just for prisoners. I'm not saying the well-being of prisoners isn't important. I'm just saying it seems to be out of character for the pragmatic Melanie. Later on in the episode, Melanie says to Jinju, maybe Sean found out the drawers are experimental. Maybe he told her about the list. What list? If my theory is right, a list of 400 people who will be put into the drawers when the train finally stops, leaving the others to freeze and die. Melanie is concerned for the well-being of people coming out of the drawers because one day she will be one of them. Now in the movie, the fact that the world is heating back up is a big reveal. But on the show train, the temperature is announced across the entire train every morning. Surely they realise that the earth is heating back up and are planning for a time when they'll be able to go outside once more. Now we'd better talk about Mr. Buckets. <clears throat> I mean Mr. Wilford. <clears throat> Sorry. Whether there's one train or two, these things we know. During the show, 
Melanie is in charge of the show train, and during the movie, Ed Harris's character is in charge of the movie train. Now, if we assume that it's the same train, that would mean that Wilford was in charge at the start, something happened to Wilford, and Melanie took over. And then something happened to Melanie, and Ed Harris's character, who may or may not be the real Mr. Wilford, takes over from her. If we accept the two trains theory, it becomes a lot more streamlined. Melanie is in charge of the show train, Wilford is in charge of the movie train. Now, this is where it gets tricky. If Ed Harris's character is the real Mr. Wilford, that would lend credence to the two trains theory. But if Ed Harris's character is an imposter like Melanie, then that puts the two trains theory on shaky ground. So let's discuss evidence for and against Ed Harris's character being the real Mr. Wilford. The evidence we have for either point is scarce, but let's start with the against. The voice from Mr. Wilford's speech in episode 3 has a British accent, whereas Ed Harris's character has an American accent. If you've had a sneak peek at IMDb, then you'll know who voices Mr. Wilford in the show. And while the voice we hear is close to their normal accent, it does sound a little to me like he's making it sound a tad more British than he usually does. At any rate, not giving him an American accent was very likely a conscious decision, either by the actor or the director. Having said that though, this actor, as much as I love him, does not have the most convincing American accent, and I could totally understand the choice by a director to just have him go with his natural accent. Now let's talk about the evidence for Ed Harris' character being the real Mr. Wilford. For starters, let's talk about the way he reacts when Claude fires her gun in the engine room. He leaps to his feet and yells, Damn it, Claude, mind the engine. And then, she's getting sensitive recently. It took me a while to realise that when he says she, he's not talking about Claude, he's talking about the engine. So he's very protective of the engine, and he personifies it. That shows that he cares about the engine in a way that you'd expect from its creator. This evidence on its own is flimsy, however, as he may only care about the engine because it's keeping everyone alive. Another piece of evidence is the way he talks. Not his voice, but the things he says. He spouts the same pseudo-religious dogma as Minister Mason does about balance and preordained positions. But unlike Minister Mason, he doesn't say it with any real reverence. He even mocks Mason's hand gesture. So like Mason, he's fully convicted of the beliefs espoused by Wilford, but unlike Mason, he doesn't say them with any sort of gravitas. Why? Because he himself is Wilford. When Mason quotes Wilford, it's as if she's quoting a god. Wilford doesn't do that because he's only quoting himself. He also knows how to maintain the engine. He takes care of it and polishes it. The part he's polishing in this picture probably doesn't actually need polishing. He's polishing it out of love, because he wants it to look nice. Wilford says that the engine is eternal, but not so all of its parts. The engine has obviously needed maintenance and repairs throughout the journey. And also, when a part goes extinct, it's Ed Harris's character that thinks to have small children perform the task manually. So the fact that Ed Harris's character has been looking after the engine all of this time does suggest that he is the real Wilford or at least that he was on the original design team like Melanie was. Now some people will discount that piece of evidence for this reason. Wilford wants Curtis to maintain the engine after Wilford dies, so how hard can it be to maintain if he's willing to leave it to Curtis? Well I'd remind you that this whole thing was not a part of Wilford's plan. His original plan was for the rebellion to end at Yekaterina Bridge. Everything since that has been improvisation. Him offering to put Curtis in charge of the train is likely an attempt to save his own skin, or at least save face after his defeat. Also, the fact that he's offering Curtis to take over his role doesn't necessarily mean that the engine is easy to maintain, it just means that Wilford is confident he can teach Curtis how to do it. And who better to teach Curtis how to maintain the engine than the engine's original creator? Let's remember that before the show, the fact that Ed Harris's character was really Wilford was never in doubt. And even though the events of the show have caused me some doubt, I'm still fairly sure that this is the real Wilford, and that he's been running the movie train the whole time. So that's about all I've got for you lovely passengers. Thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. If you enjoyed this video or thought that it was interesting, please leave a like so that people are more likely to see it, and if you really enjoyed it, maybe you'll consider sharing it. See you later.